Hi, everybody. My name is Rich Chappelle. I'm one of the executive producers of Family Guy, and welcome to Family Guy's virtual Comic-Con panel for 2020. Family Guy this year begins its fourth decade on the air. We premiered in 1999, and Family Guy would not be here without these people. So please welcome executive producer Cara Vallow. Hey. You know him as Chris Griffin and the star of the Weird Al music video, White and Nerdy, Seth Green. Hey, what's up? And you know her as Meg Griffin and Scott Moore's Marine Corps ball date, Mila Kunis. And Lois Griffin <laughs> and Chicago Bears fan, Alex Borstein. And finally, oh, I forgot, Family Guy uh, co-showrunner and executive producer, Alex Sulkin. There he is. A continuing theme. And finally, <laughs> you probably know him best as mid-level artist writer from Johnny Bravo, Seth MacFarlane. So we are all here happily, and I know, uh, Seth, you always say the best way to start any comedy panel is to talk about the importance of registering to vote. So I'm going to throw it yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I, I, I begin every conversation with this um, in all, all uh, parts of my life. Uh, yeah, Disney has partnered, let me make sure I get this right, with I Am a Voter, which is uh, a nonpartisan movement uh, housed in the Entertainment Industry Foundation dedicated to creating a cultural shift around voting and civic engagement by unifying around a central truth that our democracy works best when uh, everyone votes. Uh, this is a big year. We're electing, I, I have this list here, one president, one vice president, 33 Senate seats, 435 House seats, 11 governor seats, 10 attorneys general, seven secretary of state seats, and a partridge in a pear tree. Uh, the point is, uh, it's a lot of people who will be making a lot of important decisions. Please visit IamAVoter.com and make sure you are registered to vote. Everything from here on out gets less funny. I'll be adding applause and laughter and various sound effects throughout this. We That's very are, convincing. I thought so. So our 19th season premieres on September 27th with our 350th episode. And in honor of that milestone, Seth has selected the first act of a classic Family Guy from the fourth season for us to read that features the family. It is Model Misbehavior. It was written by Steve Callahan and directed by Sarah Frost. So we're going to jump in and do a table read of the first act. We're at the Griffin's house, and Peter is loading luggage into the car outside as Lois stands nearby. Come on, everybody. Let's go. Ah, this is so exciting. You know, this is the 10th year my father has raised his yacht in the Newport Regatta. Oh, man, I hope he lets me on his team this year. We see Stewie at the mailbox as Brian walks up carrying a duffel bag. Come on, Stewie, let's go. Yes, yes, I'm just checking the mail. He flips through the mail. I say, here's one from the vet. Oh, wait, give me that. Good Lord, worms? You have worms? I do not have worms, all right? I just got checked for worms. It Oh, wait, no, I do have worms. Oh, God. Oh, what am I going to do? I can't afford the medication for this. Well, you could ask Lois and the fat one. No, 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 you cannot tell them about this, please. You know, perhaps you should worry a little less about your pride and a little more about the creepy crawlies shawshanking their way out of your balloon knot. Come on, kids, off to Grandma and Grandpa's house. Everyone, including Chris and May, gets in the car. Thank, thank God I finally got some time away from the evil monkey in my closet. We angle on the evil monkey doing his trademark point and stare from Chris's window. As the Griffin's car backs out of the driveway, we stay on the evil monkey who withdraws in. He sighs, he grabs an album from a nearby shelf and puts an LB on the stereo. He then dons enormous headphones from which we hear Foghat's slow ride. He lies back in the bed with his hands behind his head like Mitch from Dazed and Confused. He lies there for a moment, then pulls a box out from under the bed, takes out rolling papers, and starts to roll the joint. At the Pewterschmidt's Newport Mansion, the Griffin's car pulls out front, out by the pool. Moments later, Carter and Babs Pewterschmidt sit poolside, the Griffin's enter. Lois, darling, it's wonderful to see you. Carter and Babs stand to greet the Griffins. Hi, Mom. Hi, Daddy. Grandpa. Grandpa. Carter hugs Lois, Chris, and Meg. Hello, everyone. Peter moves into Hug Carter, arms outstretched. Hi, you Mr. Pewter Schmidt. Peter, I see you. I see you're still fatter than holy hell. Uh, you can read me like a book. 
A little later, in Lois's old bedroom in the mansion, the Griffins enter. The room is still full of remnants of Lois's teen years. Uh, isn't this fun, Peter? You and I get to stay in my old high school room. Wow, this looks just like my room at home. Yeah, except for all the trophies and pictures of friends. Stewie notices one of the trophies on Lois's bookcase. Oh, that's the second most impressive trophy I've ever seen. In a flashback to an auditorium, Stewie stands at the podium of an awards show. And the Grammy for Album of the Year goes to Justin Timberlake. As Justin Timberlake rushes to the stage, Stewie swings the Grammy, nailing him right in the face. Justin goes down. Ha! It actually goes to Nelly. Nelly. Back in Lois's old bedroom, Meg picks up a sash that rests on a shelf. It reads, Miss Teen Rhode Island. Wow, Mom, were you a Miss Teen Rhode Island? I sure was, Meg, when I was 16 years old. In fact, your mom was offered a modeling contract. Really? But why didn't you take it? Lois picks up an old photo of herself as Miss Teen Rhode Island off a dresser and glances at it, sighing wistfully. <sighs> Yeah, I wanted to, but your grandfather wouldn't let me. In a flashback to the mansion, a teenage Lois stands before a seated Carter holding a piece of paper. But Daddy, they offered me a contract. My girl is not lowering herself to modeling. That sort of uncouth activity is below this family. Now go away, I'm busy. That evening at the Newport Barrington Hotel dining room, the Griffins eat with Carter and Babs, angle on Stewie and Brian. Brian takes a bite of food, Feeding the worms, are you? Stewie, shut up, all right. Yes, I imagine those little fellows are enjoying quite a feast. We zoom into Brian's stomach. We see two worms, no eyes, just mouths, sitting at a table as chunks of food drop down onto their plates. You know what's interesting? I've only been alive for six weeks. I know nothing of the world beyond this dog's stomach, and I still find John Oliver pretentious. Back to the dining room angle on the adults. So, uh, Mr. Purishman, the uh, big race is tomorrow, huh? Bet you can need some help with your boat. Yeah, what do you know about boats? I know owning a boat is either a sign of being very rich or very poor. Like you either had a lacrosse scholarship or you're shirtless and just pulling crabs out of the water with your bare hands. No one in between. Oh, sorry, Peter, you forgot one. Policeman on vacation. Oh, weekend cabins that are too close together. Yeah, people always forget that one. I'm afraid you don't know enough about boats. A little bit later in the hotel lobby, Stewie ambles down a hallway. He hears a crowd laughing from a nearby meeting room. The sign outside reads, Today, Cash Scam Seminar. Tomorrow, Fogarty Retirement Party, which is crossed out, wake. Intrigued by the crowd noise, Stewie enters the room. There he sees a salesman talking enthusiastically to a rapt crowd. On the screen behind him, we see the Cash Scam logo beneath which is a diagram of a pyramid of smiling faces, passing dollar beer bills upward with the word you at the top. Cash scam is your way to make real money. You can become rich beyond your wildest dreams by selling these fine products over the phone. We see slides of products, detergent, tires, juice boxes, angle on Stewie in the back of the room. Rich beyond my wildest dreams. I say, I could be a millionaire playboy. And a cutaway to a, the Playboy Mansion in a bedroom. Stewie is dressed like Hugh Hefner in a bathrobe and pipe. His five blonde girlfriends are lined up against the wall of his bedroom. Okay, girls, you all ready to play? The girls all giggle and nod with excitement. All right then, one, two, three, green light. The girls start across the room all giggling. Red light, green light, red light. Oh, Brandy, you're out. Sorry, you have to go unclog the Josh Gad toilet. The girls all giggle. Brandy looks horrified. Stewie hands her a plunger. Be sure to take a deep breath. It's breaching the water. At the Newport Harbor the next day, all the boats are lined up, preparing to start the regatta. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 20th annual Newport Regatta. Newport would like to extend a special welcome to all those here today who have children stationed overseas in Iraq. Angle on all the rich white people staring blankly. Ha <laughs> I'm just kidding. The rich white people laugh and applaud politely. Angle on Carter's yacht, which is at the edge near the dock. The Griffins, without Peter, and Babs stand on the dock. There they are, Team Pewterschmidt. Say, where's your husband? Or as I call him, my son in ha! <laughs> snap, snap. Oh, I'm sure he'll be along, Daddy. 
Just then, Peter floats up in a fancy bathtub rigged with drapes as a makeshift sail. Ahoy, Mr. Peter Schmidt. Peter, what the hell are you doing in my bathtub? Oh, this is not a bathtub. This is the SS Peter Schmidt kicker. The family gets into the bathtub with Peter. This is ridiculous. I won't have a member of my family racing in a bathtub. Well, Daddy, you didn't want Peter in your boat, so Team Griffin is going to give you a run for your money. And now to fire the starting gun is one of those Karens from the internet. I'm pronouncing it Karen now, and you should have known that. May I speak to your manager? He fires the gun. A little bit later on the harbor, the boats begin the race. Ah, we're not going fast enough. The Griffin's bathtub is suddenly overtaken by Carter's yacht. As Carter passes them, he shouts, Loser! What did he say? Carter throws a cell phone into the bathtub. Peter picks it up. It rings. Peter answers it. Hello? I said you're a loser. Who is this? Angle on the finish line. We see the boats approaching from a distance. Angle on the bathtub, which is lagging just behind Carter's yacht. <gasps> There's the finish line. We can't let him beat us. Well, we got to lose some extra weight. Quick, everyone take off your clothes. Peter begins to strip and throw his clothes overboard. The family, unsure, follows suit. The bathtub starts to close in on Carter. It's working. Just need a little more. Peter grabs Meg, who, like the rest of the family, is now in her underwear, and hurls her overboard with a splash and a scream. <laughs> we love you, honey! And with that, the Griffins shoot ahead of Carter and cross the finish line, stopping at the dock. The family cheers and gets out of the bathtub, exhilarated. Carter's boat pulls up. Lois, what the hell were you doing out there? Not listening to you for once, Daddy. And look what happened. I had a lot of fun. I should have stopped listening to you a long time ago. Let's go home, Peter. Right behind you. Hey, where's Meg? On a fishing boat out at sea, Seamus and his crew reel in a net filled with a lot of fish and Meg. That's what we call a manatee, boys, or in nautical slang, the sea cow. Back in the Griffin's house in the living room the next day, we see Brian dragging his rear end across the carpet. Damn these worms. Oh, this itch. Brian, Brian drags his rear end some more. Peter notices. Brian, what the hell are you doing? Uh, uh, nothing. I'm just, uh, just some uh, Pilates. Don't lie to me, Brian. I know what this is. You're looking for an ass race. He sits down on the carpet. First one to the kitchen wins. Go! Frantically scoots across the room and out the door. Still got the worms, eh? Yeah, that stupid medicine's 300 bucks. Hmm. Well, let me make a proposal. I'll front you the money and you pay it off by working for me. He hands Brian a brochure. Cash scam? Are you kidding? I don't want anything to do with that pyramid scheme. Well, very well then. Enjoy your worms. Stewie stuffs the cash in his pocket and starts to walk out. Wait, wait, wait. What would I have to do? Stewie smiles and hands him the money. Just be in my room tomorrow at 9 a.m. for orientation. Until then, keep this in mind. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. See you tomorrow. Stewie exits to the kitchen. Just then, Lois enters the front door holding a newspaper. Hey, everybody. Wait till you see this. Peter races over to the still open door and takes the newspaper. Oh, my God. Movable printed type. We must keep this from the serfs, lest they gain literacy and threaten the landed gentry. Angle out the front door where three medieval serfs till the front yard with crude implements. What do you got there, my lord? Nothing. Back to your turnips. The serfs, intimidated, go back to tilling even faster. Look, it's a picture of us at the regatta. Angle on the newspaper, the headline reads, Lower Middle Class Family Wins Regatta. The photograph shows the Griffins smiling for the camera. Wow, and... Mom, you look pretty. Oh, thank you, Chris. I thought so, too. And you know what? I'm going to take that chance my father ne never let me take when I was younger. I'm going to become a model. Hey, that's fantastic, Lois. And I'll pleasure myself to your photos. Me too. Me too. Oh, oh, God, Meg, that's sick. That's your mother. Oh, I'm just trying to fit in. Get out. Get out of this house. Meg, Meg hesitates. Peter punches a hole in the wall. I said no! Meg runs out terrified. Peter grimaces as he rubs his hand and tries to catch his breath. He slowly crosses to the door and closes it, then turns to Lois. Yeah, that's good about you modeling, Lois. And that's the end of that first act from that fourth season episode. Um, and I thought, since we are- electric, electric, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs>
Well, I think- Sorry, I sorry right. Josh Gad, that's the first time I'm seeing that. And I, I tried not to press this during it, but yeah. crickets were there. One thing, obviously we're on Zoom because of COVID uh, and obviously that's the least important thing about the pandemic, but it has changed the way stuff is done in Hollywood and animated shows are virtually the only series that are still up and running. And Seth MacFarlane, I know, has a state-of-the-art home recording studio. I'd just like to ask Alex and Mila and Seth Green to describe your own state-of-the-art home recording studios during the pandemic. So why don't we start with Alex? Uh, Alex, how state-of-the-art is your recording facility? My recording facility, I kid you not, is called a grow tent. I believe people use it to grow marijuana. It is a black, like, it's like the inside is like a baked potato tin foil, and the outside is black like a tent. And I have to zip myself in. And then within the grow tent, there's this other box thing that I put my head in and then lift this black. Like when you go to the dentist and they put that heavy lead on you, it's that over my head. So it's like a 1950s sweat box. I drop about six pounds every time I record. Really have to see it to believe it. <laughs> How about you, Mila? What is? Um, I record in um, my kid's closet because um, it's got carpeted floors. And um, I, you know, unlike Alex, I don't have a grow tent. I have a lot of sleeping bags. And my husband somehow um, jerry rigged sticks together and then created like a little um, tent, if you would, that I have to go into. And it's really hot because I'm in a really small closet. And I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry. Who's, who's your husband? <laughs> I just make me uncomfortable every time. I just, I just want to picture it. Does he, does he know anything about construction or technology? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my God. Zachy, you have no idea. I've never been more grateful to be married to a handyman that's, like, tech savvy. Oh, I'd love um, to meet him someday. <laughs> <laughs> and but I'll take a photo because I'm surrounded by um, kid sleeping bags. So I have, like, unicorns and monkeys, and they're all these padded little sleeping bags, and I'm just, like, inside of a sleeping bag tent that he put together. And our audio genius, Patrick Clark, has set everybody up remotely, and he ends up yeah. taking over their computers. And so when I was recording, and Alec and I record the actors, and when I was recording Mila once, I said, God, your kids are so cute. And she really kind of reacted like I was a stalker. What? What? What are you talking I said, they're all over the screen, because her home screen was just filled with photos. Wait, did Patrick you tell you? Oh. Wait, what? when we had to set up my recording closet, I, I was like, yeah, this sounds like a really good idea. Let me pour myself a glass of wine. I got this. A glass and a half of wine in, I was like, I, I quit. And I went <laughs> and got asked, and I was like, you handle this. I don't understand what they're asking of me. And I literally walked out. And then for an hour, Patrick and Ashton set up my recording studio. And how about you, Seth Green? What do you, where are you recording these days? Um, I've got a closet, a uh, book, uh, like a book closet with a bunch of shelves, and I put a strip of carpet on the floor, and then I bought uh, foam pieces off of Amazon, you know, like four foot by five foot, and I've Velcroed them to all of the shelves, so I've created an enclosure of baffling. Mm. Then I've got two curtain rods stretched between uh, sections of the closet with blankets draped over it. Um, That's and then me I've too. Got me like too an isolation thing with the microphone. It's really high tech. I mean, I'm I'm thinking about um, copywriting it and then manufacturing each of these individual pieces, like big fluffy throw blankets and curtain rods. I think I think I could get a trademark. And Kara, but beyond those home recording studios, what would you say were the one or two biggest challenges of converting our production to home confinement? Um, the, um, Avid editors, the animatic editors, and, um, the recording, um, recording actors that are not, uh, our, um, our, our main cast. Having to set something up for, you know, every incidental actor has come into the, to record, but the, um, setting up the, the Avid systems at home has been extremely challenging. And that's why we're now asking Seth MacFarlane to play Clerk One. It's easier <laughs> that way for him to go. So I, we have some fan questions. And, and Seth, 350 episodes, a huge milestone. Please rank your favorite episodes in reverse order, starting with 349. <laughs> <laughs> is, is this me? This is you. 
<laughs> but I, seriously, uh, fans always ask, does, does the cast have a favorite episode, a favorite cutaway, a favorite moment? What, what comes to mind over 350 episodes? Uh, you know, for me, it, it's probably our Clue episode, the, and, and, and then there were fewer. I, I'm, I'm partial to that one. How about you, Alex? I have moments that I love, and I've, I've mentioned most of them, but, and there seems to be a theme. Like, it's, I, I was laughing because this act that we just read, Seth had a moment that it's something that we've done before, and it always makes me laugh, him getting the phone and going, who is this? Or <laughs> one time when they're fighting on a boat, and he, Joe throws um, Peter something, he's like, don't throw things at me, Joe. Like, I just love those <laughs> ridiculous moments that are just pure character. And for Lois, my favorite line of all time is, who wants chowder? <laughs> How about you, Mila? What, what stands out over the 20 years? Um, well, we, we in this household quote, mommy, mom, 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 mommy, mommy, <laughs> mommy, all the time, because I didn't realize how funny it was because it's so true. And I found it originally so funny because I didn't live it. Now, all day long, I get mommy, 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 mom, mom, mom. So we quote that line a lot. The kids don't get it. We find it real funny. How old, um, you, how old will your kids be before you let them watch the show? Uh, oh, I mean, I'll let them discover it on their own. I, I think it's too, it's so weird. It would be so, I don't know, whenever they want to. Yeah. I, you know, I think the show's funny. I also, we curse in the house. The kids, it's not the censorship that worries me. It's the idea of like, why is mom's voice on a cartoon? That's weird. Oh, mom, mommy, mommy, <laughs> mom, 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 mommy. There you go. I, I, so I, I think I was being teed up for that. Oh, uh, look at Alex delighted funny. too. <laughs> and Seth Green, how about you? What, is there a moment, a... Um, I really love that the time travel episode uh, because of how insanely complicated and yet scientifically accurate it becomes with uh, uh, Brian and Stewie traveling back in time to try and correct mistakes that they've made and then eventually meeting hundreds of iterations of themselves that are all trying to undo their own mistake. I just thought that was really funny and creative and smart. And, you know, Seth was and this is a well known legend was 24 when he sold Family Guy and became the youngest show creator and showrunner in TV history. So I'd like to ask Alec, what had he accomplished by the time he was 24? <laughs> I know I had smoked a lot more pot than Seth had by 24. I can pretty much guarantee that. And also I'd like to flag some, uh, Rich, I believe you called Patrick Clark our sound genius. I'd just like to flag that. Yes. Uh, also, uh, Seth, unprompted you went to mom mom mommy that was you my friend <laughs> that was the, that was you saying we need to get this crowd there's no crowd <laughs> uh, hey alec can we see some cuomo oh no oh come on don't make me sing <laughs> hey guys you know you know what my favorite show is the next one yes <laughs> now, good that's a good EP answer <laughs> Fans want to know, Seth, if Quagmire was based on anyone you know. That was one that came up a few times. But Quag Quagmire, uh, uh, this, this is a really boring answer to this, but Quagmire is, um, uh, when I was a kid, I used, to, <laughs> I used to enjoy listening to old radio dramas on tape. And, um, uh, you know, like The Shadow and The Lone Ranger and whatnot. They used to sell them in my local bookstore. And the commercials were always guys who talk like this. Autolite spark plugs are just right for your automobile. And it was, it was such a specific, you know, that sort of mid-Atlantic dialect of the time that everybody was using. And so I kind of started there and then somehow he turned into this, uh, uh, you know, raging uh, lunatic pervert. I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure how that evolution happened, but the, the, the impetus for Quagmire was, uh, was 1940s radio. How often does it happen, Seth, that you have a voice in your head or one you hear that inspires you and that leads to the character as opposed to, I've written this character and I've got to figure out the voice? Uh, it, it's, you know, it, it's happened both ways. It's, there's been a drawing that's prompted a voice and a voice that's prompted a drawing. And uh, yeah, there's, there's no pattern to it. And, and, and Alex, Lois's voice, where, where does that come from? What was the inspiration for that? It's basically stolen from a family member. Most most things I 
who are stolen from my family. Um, a cousin in, in Long Island. And at the time that I met Seth, I was doing a live sketch comedy show and I was doing a voice very similar on stage, a sketch called Magic Man. And I was doing this very nasal, but very slow thing. And I met Seth and I did it. And he's like, that's great, but we don't have like two hours. Can you speed it up? Um, but yeah, it's, it's basically stolen from from Aggie in Long Island. And Seth Green, I have heard you tell it before, but it is such a great story of how you auditioned for Chris and where you got the inspiration for Chris's voice. Yeah, it was originally uh, sort of a play on um, Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs. And the original pitch was just so weird, I guess everybody liked it. And then over the years, it's kind of evolved because when it started, it was way more down here. And I was just like mm -hmm. the big weird son who was always masturbating and drinking stuff. <laughs> and then uh, it sort of evolved into something a lot weirder. So it's mm -hmm. more up in here and really like a lot of variety. Mm -hmm. And everyone, uh, everyone was coming in in the auditions doing surfer dude voices based on the look of the design, and Seth was the only one who came in and did something way off the rails. <laughs> and and Mila and Seth and all of you, you do a lot of obvious, you know, live action work. Is there something that you consciously think you need to do differently, or you trigger some other? you know, instinctive reaction when you're in a booth doing voiceover work than you would if you're on a movie set or Mrs. Maisel or wherever? No. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> on, my, on my list, that was going to prompt a nine minute discussion about being like no, that. I, 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 think that it, I, think, I, I think I tend to act harder in a way. I think, you know, you're not having your body in your face to, to convey things. I probably, I probably step on the gas a little bit more do, when I'm doing just a voice because you're, you're, you're without any other way to convey something. So I think I'm good with words, right? Yeah, you are. That's Thanks. <laughs> funny. I, I, I always find that it's the opposite that I, I, my whole career was started in voiceover. And when I get on camera and act on camera, it's like my first instinct is like, I think I'm playing, like toning it down. And then I look at playback and I'm like, <laughs> it's, um, oh, it's, don't, it, don't read those reviews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess no one wants to hear on a set less cartoony. Ever. <laughs> Welcome. And Seth Green, any any conscious choices you always make because you're oh. in a booth doing voiceover? My cat, my cat is making a cameo, guys. So. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously Seth Green, the creator of Robot Chicken, so has a lot of I would think at least four minutes of good anecdotes that are both funny and informative about this question. Um, I think it's the same as, as Alex. Like, I'm, I'm just conscious of the fact that I'm only able to use my voice to convey whatever emotion or gag it is. Whereas if I'm um, on camera, I find I, I, I reduce everything um, to only move in a way that's informative or only speak in a way that's informative. You can be a lot more subtle on camera than you can because you don't, you have so many more tools to express whatever the idea is. I just want to say, I second Alex and Seth. So I retract my answer of no, and I'm going to go and say what they said. I <laughs> Let the record reflect that Ms. Kunis has now adopted others' more intelligent responses as her own. Yes. Well, you know, I think it depends on the character too. Like Lois is pretty loud and boss, you know, she's screaming a lot and Meg is kind of closer to yourself. You know what I mean? She's, she's a little more chill. Yeah, but I like your answer better than mine. So I'm just gonna hijack you and say, I say what I <laughs> yeah. for, for Seth MacFarlane, you know, shows like yours and The Simpsons have been on the air for 20 and 30 years, respectively, which is kind of unprecedented, obviously. But it also means you, have been on the air for 20 years through lots of developments in the world and lots of, of developments in comedy. How do you think Family Guy, you know, the Family Guy of 2020 compares to the Family Guy of 1999? <laughs> Get that cat out of here. You, you, you can, you can borrow Mila's answer and say no. I love that the cat activated the Zoom to switch <laughs> to you. 
Yeah. Yeah, Milo, Mi Milo, what shampoo commercial are you in right now? Let's, let's <laughs> professional play. Come on. <laughs> Guys, I washed my hair yesterday, but now two of you have commented on my hair. Do you like this shampoo? That was, more, that was more than knee up. Right, right now, I'm sure that the, the fans, if they had a choice between my question about how Family Guy's evolved over 20 years or how <laughs> hair, I think we know how they're voting. So I'm just going to ask a follow-up. Have you gotten haircuts during the pandemic, Mila, or is Ashton doing it? Haircuts, in case you were wondering. Look at Alex is sitting comfortably. Well, I'd like, I'm going to ask her next. When you put them both up, it looks like boobs. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sorry, I'm eight years old. I apologize. Carry on. So, any, anything at all, Seth, about how it's changed? <laughs> yeah, how it's changed, or even in, 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 you know, just stylistically and how it's, it's, well, uh, yeah, you know, I, it's, I, I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think the fact that you guys are running it instead of me is probably the big difference, right? <laughs> That's uh -huh. a big difference, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and boy, do we miss your midnight notes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it's, 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 uh, it's all kind of a blur. Um, that, it's, it's, this might be a better question for Kara in terms yeah. of what kind of changes have happened in, in the production of the show, the, you know, the, the models and all that kind of stuff over the years. Well, when I, I didn't produce the first two seasons, when I came in third, se in third season, I did make a lot of um, structural changes because I didn't, I wasn't really comfortable with the way in which some of the production was being run and, um, then again, when we, after we got canceled and we came back, you know, enough time had gone by where um, there were certain improvements to um, the technology and, um, and having more access to people who have had enough time be between third season and when we started fourth season that had worked on shows like King of the Hill that, so I, I had a bigger pool of talent to pull from than I did um, back in third season, because there were more artists that had worked on, um, like, like that. Uh, we didn't really modernize our process in terms of integrating, um, you know, digital uh, storyboarding, you know, until, I don't know, maybe 10th season. Um, and then that's when sort of everything changed. But, um, in terms of in terms of where the show has gone artistically from 1999 to now it's um you know it's been miles and miles of of improvements over the years sort of incrementally and you know to get to where the show looks today and seth i remember long ago that mike judge name dropping mike judge said when he was doing king of the hill that he was very aware that the simpsons was out there and he he kind of, he compared it to like, if you're flipping channels, he wanted people to think that looks different. So when you were doing Family Guy, how much of that was in your head of like, I have to make sure it's, I can't do this, I have to do something that's different or? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> I sort of like it to when, when All in the Family came out and just kind of changed the face of what sitcoms looked like. Um, and it, it, it was kind of a rule book that you had to, play by but kind of do your own thing you know the, the Simpsons did the same thing when that show came out it was it looked unlike any other show they were almost doodles um, <clears throat> and for me the trick was all right well I, you know I, I recognized that that had now <clears throat> changed the playing field um, and it was really about about you know creating a stylist a, a style book that was um, its own thing but that still acknowledge the fact that, okay, this, this is now the look. I mean, it was the Simpsons. It was, I think Beavis and Butthead was around by that point and they kind of played by the same rule book. It was like very kind of doodle-ish. Um, it, it's almost like, it, it's, it, the, the animated shows that succeed are strangely, in prime time at least, are strangely uh, over, overly simplistic. And I know there are a lot of animators who, who actually 
really have a big problem with that, particularly now. They're like, it, you know, primetime animation just all looks so simplistic, but it is, there's something that, that kind of tells the brain, okay, this is an adult show as opposed to, you know, the, the shows for kids, which, which kind of look graphically more refined from an artistic standpoint. It's, a, it's an odd thing, and I, I'm not sure if it'll be the case forever, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely something that I noticed when The Simpsons emerged, and I did try to kind of acknowledge that they had changed the rule book. Alex, you, obviously you've been with the show from day one. How do you, how do you feel it's changed? Oh, I think it's changed. Incredibly, I mean, with 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 the change of writers that come into the room, you have fresh takes and you have different sensibilities and different experiences coming into the room. Um, and just, I think, after being on for so many seasons, you've done so many storylines. You have to. The writers now are tasked with not just being funny, but trying to to walk in uncharted fields and do stuff we haven't done. So I think they're forced to be that much more creative in some ways, like we're pushed to go deeper. Okay, everyone's kind of seen this. We've done this for 10 years. Now we have to kind of push in a different direction and try something different, so. More uncharted yeah. fields. Uncharted What? I said, more, we need to find more uncharted fields. Yeah, I mean, Seth felt he needed to go even further with the Orville and like space. <laughs> <laughs> but we're trying to do it in cartoon land. <laughs> and Alec, what had you accomplished by the time you were, say, 30? <laughs> wow. We're still hitting bad years. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, you know what? I had been, uh, I had been on the Late Late Show with Craig Kilborn, so not to brag. But, there you go. Yeah. And people should check out Alex Sulkin's hilarious Instagram for his. Uh oh, thank you for getting videos that, that are very timely and 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 very funny. Um, well, I think we are getting near when we will wrap up. But we, you know, it is exciting that we have our three hundred fiftieth episode in September. And we always like to give a preview of the upcoming season when we're at Comic-Con. And it's honestly one of the most fun things for me and Alec and the writers who are there because you never really get that interaction with the fans. So we miss that. And we miss being able to show you a highlight reel of our upcoming season, but you can see it on Family Guy's YouTube channel and other social media uh, addresses. I didn't know how to finish that sentence. <laughs> Platforms. Platforms, thank you, Alec. Um, <laughs> and we premiere on September 27th on Fox uh, at 9.30, 8.30 Central. We hope you'll be there. And thank you for watching this with all of us. And thank you to all the guests from, from Barcelona to Los Angeles and spots in between. <laughs> <laughs>